Thank you for joining us today to discuss one of the most pressing issues impacting our collective global future, decisive action from the United States to address climate change, both domestically and internationally. The US, which is the largest historical carbon emitter, as well as the second largest present day emitter after China, is already feeling the impacts of climate change. Wildfires worsen as conditions become hotter, snowmelt reduces and soils are drier, leading to year round risks of more fires causing more harm and risking more lives. With the federal government spending $2.4 billion fighting fires from 2014 to 2018. Rising sea levels and extreme weather are poised to significantly impact homes, property values, delicate ecosystems and military bases. A proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences study that pinpoints the effects of changing weather on the cost of disasters shows that increased precipitation resulting partially from climate change has caused an additional $2.5 billion a year in damage. These risks fall disproportionately on low income and minoritized communities in the US that have also the fewest resources to cope, meaning that equitably addressing the impacts of climate change is clearly linked to achieving wider goals of racial and social justice. Now, the US holds a precarious position in its efforts to seek a position of leadership in climate policy and diplomacy following the Trump presidency, which withdrew from the Paris Agreement, undermined climate science as a political strategy, unraveled significant environmental protections, and significantly slowed international progress toward reductions goals. Since entering the White House in January, President Biden rejoined the Paris Agreement and has pledged to prioritize combating climate change as an essential element of US foreign policy and national security. Compared with the Obama administration where climate change was a priority but managed by relatively siloed specialists, the Biden administration has made climate core to overall strategy and planning, taking a whole of government approach and granting John Kerry, the special presidential envoy on climate, a seat on the National Security Council. But we're also seeing conflicting signals and competing demands. President Biden canceled the Keystone XL pipeline, but has not shut down the Dakota Access Pipeline. Last month, the Biden administration allowed a former finance minister from Australia, who has called climate pricing a very expensive hoax, to be named Secretary General of the OECD, the 37 nation body that coordinates domestic and international economic and trade policy. Today, we're just over a week away from the Biden hosted Virtual Leaders Summit on Climate to be held April 22nd and 23rd. To provide some context, the summit is a crucial moment in the run up to the next conference of the parties or COP26 of the UN framework on climate change, currently slated to take place in Glasgow, Scotland in the first two weeks of November this year. A key goal of both the summit and COP26 is to raise ambition for countries nationally determined contributions or NDCs to keep a limit of warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius within reach. The question now is, what, where does the roadmap from US climate action lead us? I'm Rebecca Peters, the Leland Foundation Association of Marshall Scholars Academy Fellow with the Energy, Environment and Resources Group at Chatham House. Here with us today to discuss the US roadmap on climate action are our distinguished panelists who bring a multi-level perspective to bear on this conversation from city to state to national to international. I'm thrilled to introduce them with a brief summary of their much longer and impressive credentials. Janie Bavishi is the director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Resiliency, which carries out science-based analysis, program development, and capacity building. In this role, she leads the city's $20 billion plan to prepare New York City and its roughly 8.5 million residents to ensure the city is ready to emerge stronger from the multiple impacts of climate change. Previously, she served as Associate Director for Climate Preparedness at the White House Council on Environmental Quality during the Obama administration. She's a contributing author to the 2020 anthology, All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. Dr. Nathaniel Cohen serves as Senior Vice President for Climate at the Environmental Defense Fund, a New York-based nonpartisan nonprofit organization working at the intersection of science, economics, and law. At EDF, he shapes the organization's advocacy for environmentally effective and economically sound climate policy. 
Previously, Nat served in the Obama administration as special assistant to the president for energy and environment in the Natural Ec National Economic Council and Domestic Policy Council. He is co-author of Markets and the Environment from Island Press, among many other publications. Alice Hill is the David N. Rubenstein Senior Fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council on Foreign Relations, where her work focuses on the risks consequences and responses associated with climate change. She previously served as special assistant to President Barack Obama and senior director for resilience policy at the National Security Council staff, where she led the development of national policy to build resilience to catastrophic risks. I, for one, am waiting with bated breath for her forthcoming book, The Fight for Climate After COVID-19, due out this summer. Last, Dr. Kelly Sims Gallagher is Professor of Energy and Environmental Policy at the Fletcher School at Tufts University, where her research focuses on how policy spurs the development and deployment of cleaner, more efficient energy technologies, both in the US and internationally. She served in the second term of the Obama administration as a senior policy advisor in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and as senior China advisor in the Office of the Special Envoy for Climate Change at the US State Department. Her book, Titans of the Climate, co-authored with Xiaowei Xuan, is one of my very favorite comparative climate policy books. Thank you all for joining Chatham House for this timely discussion. Now that we're all introduced, the flow of this 1.5 hour event is as follows. For the first half of our session, I will pose opening questions to our panelists, and then the second half shift to moderated audience questions. Panelists will end by offering their brief closing remarks and I'll conclude our event promptly on time, 3 p.m. EST and 8 p.m. London. I encourage our audience to pose your questions directly in the chat as we go along. Please include your name and affiliation and any particular panelists you would like to direct questions to. If it's more of a general question, I'll direct it accordingly or allow panelists to decide. May I please remind everyone that this event is recorded and will be shared via the Chatham House website in about two days. Our discussion today is part of Chatham House's monthly Environment and Society discussion series in which the Energy, Environment and Resources Program brings together leading academics, practitioners, and policymakers to discuss key issues in environmental policy. Today's session is co-hosted by Chatham House's US and America's program. So to get us started, let's get the lay of the land on current domestic priorities and policy. Uh, Nat, if you might kick us off, please, with some broader framing here. What are some of the expectations for the imminent US NDC announcement? And what are some issues we're facing with achieving durable climate policy in the US, perhaps particularly speaking to some of the major fault lines between American political parties? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thanks so much, Rebecca, for that great introduction and, and scene setting. And thank you to Chatham House for hosting this event. And it's such a pleasure to be on with such a terrific other set of panelists. I'm very honored to be part of this. Um, so I will talk a little bit about the domestic policy, as you suggest. I want to frame it um, by going back to the presidential campaign that Joe Biden ran, because this was the first time that we've seen climate really be a focal point of a campaign. It was mentioned back in 2008, uh, but in fact, both President Obama, uh, then candidate Obama and, and John McCain talked about climate, but it wasn't as much of a point of contention. Last year, it was a very clear difference between the candidates, and it was something that dominated the Democratic primary debates in a way that it hadn't before. So Joe Biden ran on and won on climate, saying it was one of the main crises that uh, the U.S. needs to face. And I, I say that up front because that provides the context and the kind of political mandate for him to act. At the same time, as I'm sure our audience knows, the Congress in the United States is razor divide. It's a razor thin divide. You don't get closer than this. The Senate, the upper house is divided 50-50, which means that President Biden's vice president, Kamala Harris, who serves as the president of the Senate, has the deciding tie-breaking vote. And in the House of Representatives, the Democrats only have a handful of vote advantage. So Congress is going to be a very difficult place to get a lot of things done. So what has President Biden done? Well, as Rebecca, as you said, they really have taken, the administration has taken a whole of government approach right off the bat. Uh, the first sign were the, the set of people they named uh, to positions in the government. Of course, you had strong climate advocates, people like Michael Regan, who is the EPA administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. 
But you also had people like Brian Deese as the head of the National Economic Council, who used to be a climate advisor for President Obama. You had Janet Yellen, uh, who has been outspoken on the need for climate uh, policy as head of the Treasury. You mentioned John Kerry uh, being given a very senior position as essentially the special presidential envoy and member of the National Security Council on climate, Pete Buttigieg, and so on. Jennifer Granholm, all of the secretaries that were named to cabinet spots uh, have a climate interest. And so that's a very strong start. So what do we expect? Well, as you said, on day one, this was one of the few day one actions that the administration actually did on their first day in office. President Biden re-entered the United States into the Paris Agreement. And as you said, that means the U.S. has to come forward with its NDC, its target, uh, which will is widely expected, almost certain to be a target for 2030. Uh, and we expect that the U.S. will announce that next week, probably on the 22nd, the date of the summit, but it could come a few days earlier. So what Environmental Defense Fund and other NGOs and organizations in the U.S., as well as dozens of businesses calling for, is an NDC that includes a target of at least 50% reductions in greenhouse gas emissions across the economy by 2030 relative to the 2005 baseline. Um, but there's a lot of modeling out there that shows that that is achievable. You can identify multiple policy and technical pathways to get to that 50% reduction. Um, for comparison, the U.S. is now at about, was about 20% below uh, last year. Some of that dip was due to COVID, but there are strong tailwinds here from the falling costs of renewable power and so on. So this is an achievable target, but it is also an ambitious one. If the U.S. does announce a target of 50% or more below 2005, that will put it in the top ranks of major economies, a little bit behind uh, the EU, which is 55% below 1990 levels, but those baselines are comparable. So we're hoping to see an ambitious uh, NDC, and we expect to see that. And then very briefly, that will set the stage for domestic action. A and we'll see action in, in a few sectors and in a few tools. The sectors, you'll see power sector, the electric power sector, and the transportation sector right up front, alongside with methane emissions from oil and gas, methane being a short-lived climate pollutant that has outsized importance in the coming decades. Those are the three big areas where you can make immediate reductions um, through existing policies. On the, on the toolbox side, you'll see a mix. Uh, regulatory actions under existing law, as well as executive actions. I mentioned that whole of government approach across the agencies in the executive branch. Uh, we will see climate and clean energy be a major part of the infrastructure legislation that Congress is expected to pass later this summer, and that can be passed even with that very narrow majority I mentioned in, in Congress. And then eventually we think you'll need to see bolder, more comprehensive legislation. Um, for example, legislation that uh, put a limit and a price on carbon pollution across the US economy, that will be a heavier lift. And so that will be harder to get by this summer, uh, but I think the pressure will continue on the Biden administration and on Congress to deliver uh, on the target that it announces next week. So let me stop there and I, I know we'll have lots more conversation. Thank you so much, Nat. Great way to, to get us started thinking about these, these broader backdrop issues. Now, Janie, turning to you, might you please elaborate on the role of federal government support for tribal, city, and state level climate action, particularly speaking to the perception of trade-offs and support for mitigation versus adaptation and related equity implications? Absolutely, and thank you, Rebecca, and to Chatham House for uh, convening this event. Thank you to my fellow pa panelists for um, what I'm sure is going to be a really engaging discussion. I'm um, really looking forward to, to this event. Um, I you know, wanna just start by making a statement, which is that as we work to urgently decarbonize our economy, we must consider climate adaptation an essential form of climate action. Um, and I say this because, you know, a lot of the focus, um, uh, you know, Nat mentioned the, the uh, campaign and, and, and while climate adaptation was prominently featured in the, the uh, Biden climate uh, plan, um, the, a lot of the focus since the beginning of the administration has been focused on mitigation and we have seen less on adaptation and resilience. Um, but we're in a place where um, we have already locked in certain impacts of climate change. We're coming off of the most active Atlantic hurricane season on record. Record, the second hottest year on a record, only a hundredth of a degree 
cooler than, um, than the, the hottest year on record, which was 2016. So we know that we are already experiencing the impacts of climate change. They are not going away. And, um, and while we, we work to curb the rate of climate change through our efforts to mitigate, um, mitigate our carbon emissions, we must also prepare um, for the impacts that we cannot avoid. Um, and at the heart of this is an equity issue. Um, if we are, we, we, we also know that um, these impacts will, uh, will impact, will, will, will be faced by the, the um, communities that are most underinvested, that are historically faced neglect, um, just as a matter of course, right? There's, um, uh, there are already inequitable housing policies, in infrastructure policies, other issues that are playing out in some of our um, low income, most vulnerable communities. And um, due to all of that and, and patterns of uh, land use and settlement that have uh, put some of our um, most vulnerable communities in the lowest lying areas, they are also most likely to face the, the brunt of uh, the impacts of climate change. So we have an opportunity to take an equitable approach to adaptation and really recognize some of these historical injustices and be proactive and intentional about how we are investing and, and, and the strategies we are deploying to uh, bring equity at the center of our adaptation strategies. Um, I think this is really important to do. Um, you know, I was really pleased to see in the American Jobs Plan um, that uh, there was a lot of a lot of mention of resilience. I think the devil is going to be in the details in terms of how this plays out. Um, but it is really important that the administration is thinking about proactively funding resilience measures um, and getting getting these resources to um, state, local, and tribal governments um, to be able to take proactive action. Too often, resources for adaptation and resilience are only flowing after a disaster. Um, New York has been able to take the leadership role that it has on climate adaptation and resilience uh, because uh, we were able to unlock and access funding after Hurricane Sandy. It's those federal disaster recovery dollars that we were able to put to use um, to address the, the challenges we know are coming, um, not only from future Hurricane Sandy-like storms, but also the chronic impacts of climate change, sea level rise, extreme heat, and intense precipitation. So, um, you know, states, local uh, states, local governments, tribes, they need access to these resources proactively. It's, it's, um, it shouldn't just be re reactively after a disaster. Um, and I'm hopeful that um, as the the conversation around this infrastructure bill um, unfolds, um, we will see uh, more, more channels to access some of those resources. Thank you so much, Janie, for, for bringing in the, the city level perspective, definitely, and, and, and bringing the equity considerations to bear. And building on, on some of the particular risks that you mentioned, I'd like to turn to Alice now to kind of widen our frame to think about what are some of the security dimensions of climate policy that the U.S. should bear in mind as more coordinated policy responses develop? Well, let me echo first. Thank you so much for having me. And it's really a thrilling experience to be with these wonderful panelists who bring, I know, a huge wealth of information and knowledge about policymaking at the highest levels within the federal government. One of the things we saw on that very first day from President Biden was that he pulled back a order that President Obama had signed, which President Trump had killed, uh, and it was revived by President Biden on national security and climate change, which was a clear recognition of the national security risks that are involved. I was particularly pleased because I led the development of that. Janie helped work on it, uh, of that order. But that's just a start. It requires all the intelligence, science agencies, and national security agencies to work on understanding our climate risks. President Biden also called for the intelligence agencies to issue a national intelligence assessment about the threats of climate change to the nation. Very important measure as well. And he told the Department of Defense they need to do a better job of incorporating climate risk in their planning, including in things like war games. How would it play out if there's a very hot temperatures? Uh, will the planes fly? Will the jets fly? And it's natural to focus on these because our Department of Defense, it has a huge laydown of installations across the globe and here in the United States, uh, one of the la largest landowners certainly in the United States, and they have been severely impacted by climate impacts that affect operational readiness, military readiness to respond if we should need to respond. 
But Janie raises a key point when we talk about security. With climate change, it's not just about a military response. Climate change at its core undermines human security, access to fresh water, access to food, safe shelter, as well as livelihoods. And climate change also doesn't fall evenly around the globe. And as Janie has said, the most vulnerable will be impacted the most severely. And that can be a very destabilizing event for governments. We know that bad actors, malcontents, terrorists, criminal networks, organized crime take advantage of these moments of crisis to make inroads and to recruit. And we see that. We saw that during the pandemic, for example. We saw Boko Haram. We saw um, Islamic extremists saying it's better to die in a fight than it is to die from the pandemic. So we need to plan for that as well. As human security is degraded by climate change, what will be the response? And that doesn't just encompass a military response. It's got to be development and diplomacy. And we're, the Biden administration has been a little less clear about how those components, at a minimum, the United States needs to meet its, its pledges for the Green Climate Fund. That's the fund that will allow uh, developing nations who have had the least to do with the climate problem to uh, transition to clean energy plus uh, adapt. We need to make sure that all of our development work focuses on building adaptation as one former secretary, Jim Mattis, for President Trump said in arguing that or supporting it, that the State Department should receive more funds. He said, basically, if the dipl diplomatic and the development efforts are not funded, it means essentially that the Department of Defense needs to buy more bullets. And that's the fear, is that as climate impacts worsen, we will end up securitizing our response. Uh, and you can see the hints of this when you saw the massive migration, a very small in terms of comparison to what's predicted will happen with climate change, of 5 million people from Syria after they had a 1,200 year drought. Many young men moved to cities, a lot of civil unrest followed because of government policies, because of, because of mismanagement of water, but also because of the severe drought that caused people to be on the move because there were human security threats. And that threat to Europe of just 5 million people, if you look across the globe, how will the globe respond? It is imperative, as Janie has said, that we also, in addition to mitigation, focus on adaptation. And the moment right now is very perilous in light of the pandemic. These developing nations, many of them have taken on excessive levels of debt. They will be unable to pay that debt. And because the debt repayment is, is so high, they won't be able to address and build the measures that they need to keep their population safe. So the security challenges are mounting. The Biden team has made a good response. Much more remains to be done to really have a handle on the impacts that we will continue to suffer. Even if we get to zero tomorrow, because of the delayed effect of the accumulated greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you so much, Alice. And, and picking up on that question of diplomacy, I'd like to turn to Kelly to further expand on the international considerations of climate action, particularly for US and China relations. In late March, Chatham House published a research paper on China, EU, and US cooperation on climate and energy. In it, the authors suggest that cooperation on climate change has lost momentum and we're seeing new battle lines drawn in the US-China bilateral relationship. And now, of course, John Kerry um, is in Shanghai today as the first Biden administration official to visit China. So what do we hope or expect to see in the coming days leading up to the US climate summit? And what are some of the wider trends shaping the place of climate diplomacy within wider foreign affairs issues in the US and Chinese relationship ahead of COP26? Great, thanks so much, Rebecca. Really pleased to be here. I add my thanks uh, to Chatham House and to you for organizing this. Um, you know, the, the US-China relationship and US diplomacy is just 
um, inevitably entangled with U.S. domestic progress. Um, and I think we have a, a bit of a chicken and an egg problem right now because so many countries are looking to the United States to see what the United States is going to do before they decide whether they're going to enhance their own ambition and their own actions. So I think there's, you know, all eyes are on this summit that's going to be taking place next week uh, because so many uh, countries are looking to see what the United States plans to do. And indeed, um, it was it was definitely damaging to international trust for the United States to leave the Paris Agreement. As great as it is to have the United States come back, I think trust has been sort of um, affected you know, by that event of, of the United States uh, leaving and, and now coming back. Um, and so I think uh, in particular for China, they're looking very uh, hard at what the United States is gonna be able to do. Um, and in particular, what US domestic action will look like. Um, I think, um, I want to just add a few a few points to what Nat actually put on the table at the outset. Um, there's a lot going on, and there's a lot that is envisioned by the Biden administration. Um, so much in the infrastructure <laughs> and jobs plan. Um, you know, just to pull out a couple of other things. You know, there's a proposal there for a green bank, which would allow, which which they call a an accelerator which would really allow the financing for a lot of the infrastructure, both on the adaptation resilience side and on the mitigation side, would allow uh, uh, the federal government to be able to direct funds to uh, local communities uh, where there's particular financing needs. Um, and I think um, uh, there's also the ability to really work on economic diversification and, and development of a clean economy in the United States. And that's just very much built into Joe Biden's idea of building back better, building an economy for the 21st century, which really is a low carbon economy. And that means the United States needs to be able to compete in these low carbon industries um, and specifically to be able to compete with China. Um, and that is going to involve, you know, some important investments in innovation, which is also envisioned and was announced um, as part of the new budget this week. Um, but the United States can't just stop at investing in R&D. It also needs to be developing the, the manufacturing, the jobs associated with these um, clean energy technologies so that the United States can be part of the, you know, capturing the global market in these in these technologies, creating the jobs um, and creating the economic value added uh, that's that's so important. So China is looking at the United States to see what are we going to be doing? Um, are we going to be, you know, come back as a major economic competitor in these in these industries? Do we have um, a sensible plan that's believable in terms of our uh, ability to actually honor our commitments? Um, and I have to say, the, to the extent to which we could actually proceed with um, developing and passing a US climate law, that would help a lot in terms of creating the credibility internationally. Um, and of course, it would help a lot with avoiding these massive swings in um, in policy, you know, regulatory policy and so forth from Republican to Democratic administrations. Um, so I, I've been advocating for really starting to think seriously about about climate legislation, um, so that we can we can do that. I think to your your broader question about how do we think about cooperation between the U.S. and China. Um, it's really challenging right now to envision formalized cooperation uh, in the way that um, we were able to do during the Obama administration. I think tensions are quite high. There's a lot of mistrust between the two countries. Um, but it's very important for us to have uh, strong coordination. If the two countries are, are working in parallel, 
um, to advance domestic action, to um, increase their ambition. You know, many other countries will notice that and we can each inspire each other, whether it's in that race to the top in terms of economic competitiveness or in providing that model to other countries of how you can actually achieve a low carbon economy. Um, the one area where I would really like to see cooperation, if we can um, kind of overcome our political resistance to doing that is in greening overseas development aid. Um, in part because we see just such a rapid growth in the development of energy infrastructure in South Asia, Africa, Latin America, and how important it is to make sure that that new infrastructure is green and clean. Um, and it also gives us an opportunity um, to work on the resilience side, um, which helps get at some of the issues that Alice was raising of how do we create you know, resilient economies in developing countries um, that aren't so vulnerable to climate change. Thank you very much. And I, I think it's really interesting that you mentioned coordination because of the, the multiple words we hear to, to talk about US and China, it's compete or cooperate and very little of anything in between and, and coordination indeed might be an area. And to pick up on this point about developing countries, uh, the forthcoming leader summit is reconvening the US led major economies forum with the 17 countries that are responsible for about 80% of GDP and global emissions. And for the first time, including invitations to heads of countries that are vulnerable to climate change impacts or are demonstrating strong climate leadership, such as Bangladesh, which is chairing the Climate Vulnerable Forum. The summit also aims to profile the economic, economic benefits of climate action and to mobilize finance needed to drive a net zero transition. Um, several panelists have mentioned the GCF, for example. So building on what we've discussed about reestablishing trust in the US, what are some of the key implications of the upcoming climate summit related to establishing US credibility on climate policy? And what does this mean for some of our domestic and international engagements? Um, if Nat might want to speak in a little bit more depth here on uh, the theme of increasing ambition and maybe the US role in um, thinking about international support via the GCF. Thank you. Sure, thanks. And I, I great, it's great discussion so far. And I think Kelly, Kelly raised some really good points, both about the domestic action that the, Obama, that the Biden administration is envisioning, as well as about some of the challenges internationally. So I wanna pick up on this point a little bit about durability that we've been talking a little bit about, but, but I think is relevant to the credibility issue that you just raised, Rebecca, which in turn is gonna be critical to the United States bringing along other countries. Um, I think part of the credibility is just, uh, is, is what the US can do already and has done already, showing that it's really taking a whole of government approach, putting the right people in the right places. Um, I think a big test will be what it comes out with next week in terms of the NDC. But I think if that starts with a five uh, or has a range that starts with a five, I think that will really help galvanize action from some other major emitters that have been sort of staying on the sideline, Korea, Japan, Canada, waiting to see what the US does and whether they can match it. Um, so I think that's some things that the US can do sort of right away. But in the long run, it's going to take demonstrating that the changes in, and the policies uh, and, and facts on the ground are, are going to be durable. Uh, I think Kelly mentioned, um, and, and I, I think others have mentioned the damage done, of course, by the Trump administration, damage not only in terms of four lost years in which we didn't make any progress on climate, but also damage, real deep damage to the United States um, credibility abroad. From my point of view, uh, th this, th this is both a, a key issue in climate, but climate turns out to be one of the ways to address this. In other words, uh, the Trump years left the United States, I think, suffering a credibility def deficit more broadly, not just on climate, but across the board in multilateralism. And, and I think what we're seeing with the Biden administration is leaning into climate right out, right off the bat because actually climate change can be a way, an early easy way for the United States to start to re-establish and, and demonstrate its commitment to multilateralism. There are other processes, the Iran nuclear deal, other forms of multilateralism, you know, re-engaging the G7, G20 and so on, but those will take longer. Uh, and so we're seeing them right off the bat saying, look, here's a issue that our allies care about, the rest of the world cares about, it's central to, um, to global prosperity in this century. And, and we're gonna start in on, on that piece. I think to make that 
credibility lasting, but we're going to have to see the kinds of policies in place that I think Kelly referred to. In other words, not just um, infrastructure spending, although that's really important, but also longer duration policies, maybe not in the coming months, but over this first term of the Biden administration or over this term of the Biden administration. Uh, and we're also going to need to see, you know, the um, other actors. I mean, Janie was talking, mentioned cities and states and, and those actors, they've already been carrying the load over the last four years while the White House, while the Trump White House was trying to take us in a different direction. And I think continued action by the states and cities and, and doing that in a way that is uh, feeding up into and really integrated into um, what is happening at the national level, that's going to be critical to anchoring national action in the action that states and cities are taking. And, and that's one way to make it both more durable and I think more credible to the rest of the world. That's a, a very useful segue to, to ask Janie here about the, you know, in terms of these longer duration policies and thinking about the time scale at which cities versus states versus countries are thinking, how are cities like New York, um, you know, how have they carried the load uh, and how are they responding now? What do cities need now from federal government or from other actors to be able to, to move forward? Yeah, you know, as we talk about cities and states, um, and, and I think there was a lot of talk about city and state leadership during the Trump years, um, I think it's just important to recognize that that leadership, while incredibly critically important, does not absolve the federal government of its role and its responsibility. So I just want to be, be very clear about that. You know, I, I think the, the all levels of government really need to be working together and in tandem to um, rise to the challenge that climate change presents. Um, in New York, you know, we passed the Climate Mobilization Act um, in uh, 2019. Um, it's essentially our Green New Deal. It sets clean energy standards for buildings, which is where most of 80% of our carbon emissions in New York City come from our buildings. And so, um, you know, we're, we're transforming our buildings uh, so that they are cleaner uh, going forward. Um, and on the resilience side, we are moving ahead with the implementation of our $20 billion resiliency portfolio. Again, 15 billion of that came from federal post-Sandy disaster recovery dollars, um, but the city has skin in the game. The city's invested the other five billion or so. Um, and so we're building a new class of infrastructure to protect our 520 miles of coastline. By the way, that's more than uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, and Boston combined. Um, uh, we expect up to two feet of sea level rise by the 2050s. That number goes up to six feet by the end of the century. So um, there's some significant challenges we have to address. Um, we are also implementing a multi-layered strategy that doesn't just um, focus on the coastline, but also uh, focuses on upgrading our buildings, hardening our infrastructure, and equipping our residents and businesses with information and tools to make more inform informed de decisions in the face of climate change. But ultimately, in terms of durability, this is about really evolving our governance uh, structures and mechanisms um, to take climate risk into account in everything we do. And to that end, you know, we recently, just last month, uh, pass a mandate here in New York City to account for future climate risks um, that includes storm surge, sea level rise, extreme heat, and intense precipitation, and then in the design and construction of all of our buildings and infrastructure that is city funded. So this is essentially means that we're going to be taking account uh, climate considerations in our entire $90 billion capital program. Um, and this is a huge step in the right direction. We need to be getting to a point where every land use decision, every housing decision, every new uh, construction um, takes climate risk into account. And this is a, a step in that direction. And ultimately, this is the kind of organizational change we're gonna need to see at the federal level too. This is not just about new pots of money and big new programs. It is about embedding climate considerations across everything the federal government already does and all the money the federal government already spends. Thank you so much, Jamie. And thinking about the the post COVID landscape now and thinking about some proposals for, for green recovery. Uh, we've touched briefly on Biden's American uh, jobs plan dubbed the infrastructure bill, which is a $2.3 trillion package. And the plan's core components, transportation, buildings and utilities and jobs and innovation account for overdue investments in traditional infrastructure, including roads, bridges, railways and airports, as well as in electric vehicles, the electric grid and water systems. 
The bill also proposes significant investments in American manufacturing of green technology, combining a job creation plan and workforce transition from fossil fuel industries with climate relevant tech for batteries, solar and wind, among other things. So what barriers does this bill face and what are some sources of support or pressure for and against action? I'd like to first turn to Alice as this might be a good opportunity to draw from your forthcoming book. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, of course, the Jobs Act uh, was an important signal by President Biden of his continued intention to turn the ship around and for the first time to have the United States really join the EU and nations like Korea in trying to green the recovery a little bit better to address climate as we address the fallout from the pandemic. Uh, so that's welcome news uh, and it would be important for all of us to applaud the effort to become greener. There are some uh, significant concerns with the jobs bill, not only from those that are Republicans, uh, but uh, also uh, from the Democratic side. And um, when they particularly relate to climate change, uh, it gets to this issue of ad adaptation. If we, for example, as the bill calls for, put $25 billion into renovating our airports, we need to ask the question, where are many of these airports located? They're in coastal cities and they're right next to water. What are we thinking about in terms of making further investments? What are our long-term plans for these major infrastructure projects if they are threatened by climate change impacts that will undermine their ability to operate at all? If people can't get to the airport, it doesn't do much good to build the airport way up high uh, if their roads can't meet them. So, uh, we need to think through this. Uh, we do not have a national adaptation strategy. We are a laggard. Uh, EU just issued theirs. UK has done theirs. Uh, Australia has one. Japan has one. Uh, developed nations, as well as developing nations, are creating more of these, but we don't have one. And it shows. Uh, because we don't yet address this critical issue of land use. And I think that will be a Achilles heel moving forward if we talk about weaknesses for the American economy, because if we take this once in a generation opportunity for trillions of dollars into rebuilding what's already there, we won't have addressed the new circumstances that will confront all of us inevitably, even if we're really successful, as we must be. I do never want to suggest we don't need to mitigate. We do. We need to cut our emissions. But even if we're successful there, we're going to be battered. And of course, as Janie has said, this is going to hit the most vulnerable uh, populations within the United States. And I think that will be a very challenging development. So I'm hoping that the Biden administration uh, will change course. And of course, I hope that we will also be finding further ways to collaborate with our allies, particularly with the EU, which has been very, as well as the UK, very interested in seeing ways to help uh, unite on research, uh, on finding common ground here so that the United States can catch up. Uh, but we are at a precipitous moment uh, that's uh, going to really uh, define a lot of what's ahead for the United States. Thank you for that, Allison. Speaking on uh, developing pol uh, developing strategy, rather, uh, just before we shift to audience questions, I'd like to, to ask Alice about the role of data in climate policy. So many emissions are estimated for various sectors of the US, um, for example, and this makes it very difficult to develop policies to mitigate emissions if we don't know where they're coming from um, or to put adaptation strategies into place if we don't know where the biggest problems are and what those problems are. So what is the role of, of policy and technology for tracking, tracing, and evaluating progress for emissions reductions and improving adaptation strategies? Well, I think that the federal government plays a very important role here in terms of uh, making sure that we have uh, the best science available and that we develop uh, measurement systems. Although I do sit on the board of EDF and I know that they have done excellent work in helping measure the uh, methane emissions that are going undetected and to help governments better understand how we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. I will say that there is one major challenge that is uh, ahead and that's how do we make 
this data, these tools, accessible and affordable for communities. And the question that all of us need to keep in mind as we go forward is a question that I was asked by uh, the mayor of a small town in Alabama uh, who faces sea level rise, storm surge, bigger hurricanes. She said, I get it. I get that I have risks. I know I need to cut my emissions, but I have no planning department. I'm a small town mayor. What am I supposed to do? And the federal government, no government yet has answered that question. And I think that's a critical role for the federal government going forward. And that requires data, data analytics, the latest modeling, and it can't all be in the private sector because we will leave many communities behind if that's what we do. Thank you all so much for, um, for these thoughtful responses to our uh, opening questions. We're gonna now shift over to moderated audience Q&A and we have a tremendous number of fantastic questions coming in through the chat. So uh, it's, it's always difficult to, to pick and choose, but I, I've just seen one here from uh, Robert Faulkner, who's the interim director of the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics. Um, which is addressed to, to all panelists or anyone who would like to pick this up regarding the European Union, which is debating the introduction of a carbon border tax uh, to level the playing field with uh, international competitors. And he asks, how do you think such a move will play out in the US? And has there been any interest in a joint US-EU approach to thinking about carbon tariffs in support of the Paris Agreement? Well, why don't I start? And I suspect Nat will wanna say something too. Um, you know, I think that this is a very interesting initiative. Uh, you know, it's obviously, I think, putting pressure on the Biden administration right now because um, the United States is not really in a position to be able to um, counter such a, um, a border tax adjustment. Uh, so it's uncomfortable for the Biden administration. Um, but I think this is a, you know, generally speaking, an, an interesting and useful policy tool that can be employed. Um, one has to be really careful and thoughtful about how it's constructed and how it's done. What is the equivalency, you know, in the policies? So if the United States decided it wanted to, I'm sorry, if the EU decided it wanted to impose a border tax adjustment against the United States, for example, you know, what's it gonna count? Um, what's what's in what's out um and you know we can obviously then extrapolate this and think about extending it in the context of um a border tax adjustment against china um when such things are done there's always measures and countermeasures that have to be thought through you know all the way to the end so you have to sort of imagine and play out that whole game and make sure it's a good idea to do um but I think it's interesting they've put it on the table now. It's it's clearly um, uh, reflects the competitiveness concerns that European firms have about you know here we he, here we in the Euro, in in the European Union um, are taking on a lot of commitments and um, are have you know very substantial climate action. Um, and we want to make sure we're not put at a competitive disadvantage. And, and so, you know, it's very understandable where this is coming from. Nat, over to you. Sure, I'll just add three quick points. I agree with everything Kelly said. The first one is, um, as, I'm, as I know Bob knows, uh, that the, uh, the data shows that this is an issue, the competitiveness issue is, is really limited to a handful of industrial sectors uh, that are very energy intensive and are also trade exposed. And, and even for them, it's a pretty small number, but politically it's quite important. So I understand why the European Union is thinking about this, but we should understand this is not an economy-wide issue. This is a very narrow issue. The second point is if we do think about border adjustment mechanisms, I, I think I agree with Kelly, it's an interesting issue. We ought to be, you know, it's reasonable to put on the table, but we, I think policymakers should understand it's not a um, scalpel, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a sledgehammer. In other words, it's a, it's, a bro it's a blunt force instrument that should be used to create incentives for other countries to come along and set equivalent policies. But it shouldn't be thought of as a way to micromanage the pricing of other or extend the carbon price to other 
uh, countries, as sometimes economists like to think in theory. It's, it's really a blunt force negotiating tool, and that has implications for policy design, including allowing plenty of time for other countries to respond and, uh, and to get their policies up to snuff. The third and last point is that there is a lot of interest in this in the U.S. government, but I think it's really important that the U.S. government needs to recognize the U.S. doesn't get to put a bar border adjustment measure on unless we have a comprehensive uh, comprehensive policy in place to control our own emissions. So there's lots of interest in having a muscular trade policy. But before we do that, the U.S. is going to need to have a much more muscular domestic climate policy. Picking up on that theme of a muscular domestic policy, I'd like to take a question from Leah Trotman, who has asked about our island territories. So the U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Northern Mariana Islands, et cetera. Um, as we move forward, uh, Leah has communicated that she she feels that these communicate these communities haven't been as involved um, in in discussions as they should be, and that even when we talk about the impacts of hurricanes, a lot of the talk is focused on coastal cities. Um, so, how do we think about including U.S. territories more intentionally and meaningfully? Uh, perhaps this is something for for Janie or Alice. I, I think um, it's a great question, and I think that um, you know partnership and two-way dialogue between the federal government and leaders of um, states, localities, tribes, and territories will be extremely important, um, especially uh, to inform federal adaptation and resilience policy going forward. You know, during the Obama administration, we have the state, local, and tribal leaders task force, but it was a kind of a one-off, um, you know, uh, effort. Um, it was crucially important to provide some uh, quick input into the Obama administration's adaptation policy. And, you know, we were able to follow up on the recommendations that were made by the task force um, and uh, and implement most of what, what they put forward. Um, but, you know, it doesn't end there. I think that it would be great to see the Biden administration set up something similar that is ongoing um, and that really brings the diversity of voices uh, that we need to the table so that we can address um, with the federal government can be prepared to address and support um, local state, uh, local locality states, territories, and tribes um, to uh, prepare for a range of hazards um, in a range of different contexts. Thank you. Alice, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I think Jenny said it brilliantly, uh, and we obviously need to do more. Uh, we are need to address all of our communities. Uh, and unfortunately, right now, it's mostly the very rich communities who have been or states that have been able to make further progress on these challenges. I can just jump in. I'd like to make one more point, which is that I think we don't need to have such a bright red line between resiliency and mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of uh, measures that we can take that can have kind of what we say in the academic literature, like co-benefits. Um, so in many respects, sometimes renewables, um, we can think of those as a good um, resiliency measure because you can bounce back faster after an extreme weather event if you have uh, renewables um, or um, land use change interventions. Um, and I'm thinking in a small island state context, um, you know, uh, preservation of wetlands, for example, can be a really important way to actually reduce emissions, uh, but also can help buffer from extreme weather events, um, uh, storm surges, and so forth. And by thinking in a synergistic way, how to address, um, uh, you know, the needs of uh, communities, states, nations, um, we actually can be take more kind of cost effective, get more value out of every dollar spent um, with these investments. Thank you so much. And speaking of, of that idea of being a bit more specific in particular areas, we have a question that's come through from uh, Charles Enoch from St. Anthony's College with uh, University of Oxford. And he's asked, uh, you know, much of the discussion has been on energy or transport, um, but the, another really major source of pollution has come from agriculture in terms of methane um, and carbon and land use change. Uh, and, and Charles has pointed out that there should be consideration around plant-based food and other 
other efforts to, to think about changing agriculture. So I, I'm curious to what extent um, does this feature in US policy planning? Um, and if it isn't more prominent yet, how might we raise that up on the agenda? So I, I can take a quick stab at this um, from the US point of view. I, I think the certainly the agricultural, the, the role of agriculture in, uh, and this is actually a great example, by the way, of what Kelly was just saying, it, agriculture straddles resilience and mitigation. It is both a source of emissions and uh, and is one of the sectors hit hardest by climate change. And in fact, it, it reaches into a third area, which is carbon removal, because agricultural practices can be used to actually remove carbon from the atmosphere and store it in, in soils. Um, so I, from the point of view of, of, of uh, agricultural croplands and ranch lands and forest lands, this is actually an area, an active area of interest in U.S. policy, both uh, in the uh, executive branch uh, in the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where um, Tom Vilsack, uh, the, the Secretary of Agriculture, has, has appointed Robert Bonney uh, as a senior advisor. Robert was a um, senior official in the USDA back in the Obama administration and has been thinking deeply about these issues as much as anybody. Another great example of the whole of government approach that the Biden administ administration is taking. So on the executive branch side, the Biden administration is thinking a lot about ideas like a soil carbon bank, a, a way of providing economic incentives to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to farmers and ranchers and forest landowners who took practices to steward the land and also store more carbon in the soil. This is kind of like the conservation reserve program that's been in place for many years that, uh, address, that provides economic incentive to protect marginal uh, land for habitat. So there are th there's thinking going on in the USDA and the Department of Agriculture, uh, as well as thinking going on in Congress. Actually, agriculture and, uh, and the area of land use generally is one of the few areas where there's been bipartisan agreement on, uh, or at least bipartisan progress, I should say, on climate. Um, an act called the Growing Climate Solutions Act was introduced last year uh, in, a, in a bipartisan way. Senator Braun of Indiana is a Republican and Senator Stabenow of Michigan. Uh, and there's actually a, a, who's a Democrat, they introduced that, they introduced that last year, we'll probably introduce, introduce it again. And there's a coalition of uh, farm, farm associations, ranchers, forest landowners, and NGOs that EDF is part of that is all about advancing these policies. So in the area of how do you think about agricultural practices and, and soil practices that increase soil carbon, that improve resilience, that improve crop yields and help address climate, there's a lot of action. Not as much, I will say, on the other aspect of it, which was, uh, which was you know, animal husbandry and cattle, livestock and so on. Um, that's, not as, that's not been as much a focus on, on policymakers, but certainly on that other aspect of agriculture, um, there's a lot of action in the U.S. Is there uh, anyone else who would like to jump in there? Alice, did you have something? Okay, we have, oh, please go ahead. No, I, uh, everything that uh, you've just heard is uh, absolutely true. Uh, I, the only possible thing I would add is that also ag is very concerned about the wildfire problems we have. So we're seeing a more concept for comprehensive approach and then, of course, President Biden has directed each of these agencies to get very serious about planning uh, for climate change. So we shall see some new iterations of plans that will touch on the issues that Nat's already uh, brought up, as well as the resilience side. Thank you. Well, picking up on this question of, of land use, um, we have a question from Giancarlo in Brazil, who's pointed that Bolsonaro's environmental policies have been uh, uh, less than desirable for addressing climate change. And Biden has, has commented on this, but the, the question is, is how is Biden thinking about negotiating with Brazil um, to reach kind of a you know, low carbon economy and to, to protect the Amazon, um, particularly considering that there's another year and eight months or so of Bolsonaro in office. Um, and a, a hot topic in the news lately has been a potential offer or consideration of the US government to pay Brazil to protect the Amazon. And I know that that's a, a hot button issue leading up to the, the US climate summit. Well, let me, let me start by just saying, I don't have high hopes uh, that we're gonna see, you know, a lot of movement from the Bolsonaro administration, um, you know, from his campaign all the way through his presidency, he's been pretty consistently anti-climate and 
and anti um, Amazon protection. Um, he he hasn't even upheld existing Brazilian laws uh, that are you know requ <laughs> require him to uh, protect the the Amazon. Um, and interestingly, he's left a lot of money on the table um, that was you know created in the context of the Red Program, the reduced emissions from deforestation and land degradation. Um, Norway and other countries, you know, pledge to on a performance basis uh, help. Uh, compensate Brazil uh, for um, protecting uh, the Amazon and um, reducing deforestation. Uh, and actually, uh, tremendous progress was made up until Bolsonaro's term um, to reduce deforestation. It was one of the great climate success stories, actually. Um, but, but, you know, he's essentially left that money on the table. He's not been taking advantage of it. And, um, so it's it's hard to see, you know, what it would take um, to convince him to change um, at this point. Uh, I think probably the best strategy is to prepare for the next, you know, whoever is the next administration and start thinking seriously about um, what Brazil could do uh, with different leadership. I might just add a few things. I I think Kelly had made some great points. I I would add a couple things. One is. You know, there's a parallel here between Brazil today under Bolsonaro and the U.S. of the last four years under Trump, and that is that governors and states are actually taking the lead in many cases in Brazil. In particular, the Amazon state governors have been taking the lead on action to reduce deforestation and promote a different green growth, sustainable development agenda that provides, sustains livelihoods, promote, you know, promotes the interests of forest communities and indigenous peoples, and also can increase agricultural production while reducing deforestation. Now they can't do it on their own. And that's why you've seen deforestation tick up in Brazil uh, over the last several years since it, since it hit a low in 2012, and especially over the past couple of years under Bolsonaro. But the, but the Amazon state governors are doing uh, lots of things in places like Mato Grosso, which is the size of the U.S. state of Texas plus half of California and one of the largest agricultural producers in the world. Um, over two different successive administrations of different parties, the Mato Grosso government has seen the value of, you know, instituting policies in place to protect forests while, again, while finding ways to increase agricultural production. Uh, that's the lifeblood of the economy. So there is progress going on. Um, but I will, but the, the states is really where it's happening. I, I'll just say two other quick things. One is President Biden did announce on the campaign trail one of the few specific things he said about climate in foreign policy was that he wanted to mobilize twenty billion dollars to protect the Amazon uh, and to protect tropical forests, and particularly the Amazon. And, and I don't think we'll see that twenty billion dollars next week, but um, but I do think we'll start to see some action on this. It is a priority for the president. I don't think we will see. The deal that was reported, um, I, I, I think uh, the I think the Biden administration has heard from a lot of voices, including from voices on the ground in Brazil and from indigenous peoples, uh, that they need to be very cautious in um, in making a deal with this administration, with with the Bolsonaro administration, and with his uh, with, with with his with his uh, his cabinet. And so, I think there's real caution there. Um, you know, interested in finding ways that the U.S. can help protect the Amazon, but but aware um, that it can't just be you know that 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 the the real people the, the the areas where the progress is really being made uh, are at the state level uh, and indigenous territories and not the Bolsonaro government. Um, the questions are coming in hot and heavy here. So I'm, um, yeah, it's always difficult to, to know what to choose next, but I'm gonna kind of group a few that have come through around the question of bipartisan support for climate change and also around the question of uh, carbon pricing, carbon taxes, and the social cost of carbon. Um, so we have a question from Jean uh, Jiwon Choi from NYU Center for Global Affairs asking what the Biden administration's social cost of carbon should be. And what I might do just to uh, contextualize a little bit of the conversation for some of our global audience who might not have the uh, pers you know, inner perspective on what's happening with carbon pricing, things have kind of come roughly full circle in some respects in that we have opposition to carbon pricing from both parties, um, not equally, but um, 
the the perception of um, environmentalists, unfortunately, sometimes in the US is that of, of a watermelon, that one is green on the outside and red on the inside, as Michael Mann said in his new book, um, the idea that environmentalists have a, a, a social socialist agenda behind the environmental policies. Um, and then on the progressive side, the Green New Deal has, has overtly rejected any kind of market mechanism that could be involved in um, addressing climate change. So it'd be helpful to hear from panelists is how do we think about this from a bar bipartisan perspective? How do we close that gap in the perception of um, environmental initiatives um, that are trying to achieve environmental good and social good with um, concerns with uh, market mechanisms being involved in achieving those goals? Uh, well, let me start. I, I think that there's a really strong bipartisan consensus that the United States needs to be economically competitive. Um, and a big part of that is making sure that the U.S. competitive position in the low carbon and resiliency technologies that are going to be needed during this century is strong. Um, and that means investing in human capital and making sure that our workers are um, well-trained and highly skilled to be able to um, contribute to the transition and also making sure that we're developing um, the industries that are going to be needed. And I, I don't, you know, I can't think of a single Republican who would disagree with that, right? It's, it's absolutely essential that the United States be able to um, benefit from the economic transition um, and this low carbon transition. You know, right now we only have one American firm uh, out of the top 10 solar companies around the world. We only have one American firm in the top five of the lithium lithium ion battery companies. So um, it's, it's not that the United States isn't capable <laughs> of being competitive. It just needs to, you know, get its act together, um, have a plan and execute a plan. Um, and that, that really does involve bipart you know, bringing together on a bipartisan basis, um, the uh, Republicans and Democrats um, to agree on a plan um, and then to execute it through through policy and legislation. Maybe I'll speak to the carbon pricing piece specifically, just briefly. Um, it is certainly the case that the conventional wisdom now in Washington is that a carbon price is not on the table. If you were to go to pick an NGO person or a K Street lobbyist off the street, uh, they would tell you no, carbon price is not going to happen. Um, and I think it's I think it's, you know, at, at, at the, as I said in the beginning, it would be a heavy lift, not impossible, but a heavy lift to get carbon price legislation, I think, this year, although I, I don't think it's impossible given the revenue needs. But I do think that conventional wisdom has a way of changing. And there are some pretty strong underlying currents uh, that I think support over the long run a move towards um, some form of carbon price in the U.S. First is if you look around the world. It's being put in place in more and more places around the world now. For you know, twenty-five percent of carbon emissions, are, roughly speaking, are uh, are under some form of carbon price. Even in the U.S. states, market-based approaches are increasingly the choice of uh, state uh, of states who are looking for ways to to put enforceable limits on carbon pollution. Um, we see more and more states actually uh, taking that uh, that approach, either for the power sector or for their economies as a whole. Um, and even in, and then if you just look at Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., there is, a, I think, you know, on, on the one hand, there's a huge appetite and a need for, uh, for injecting government spending into the economy to create jobs, to address inequities and so on. We've talked about the infrastructure bill. Uh, but, you know, I think there's also an increasing realization on Capitol Hill that at some point you need to pay for it. Maybe not every dollar. Maybe you could, you know, there's certainly room to um, to have some of it be deficit spending. But at some point when you have a $1.9 trillion budget in the beginning, and then you add 2.3 trillion, at some point that becomes real money that you've got to find a way to pay for. Now the Biden administration has proposed uh, ratcheting back up corporate taxes. That would certainly be one way to get the revenue. Um, but a carbon tax of the size that would be in line with the social cost of carbon, the current value of the social cost of carbon, by the way, is $51 probably will be higher when the Biden administration revisits the science uh, in the coming months. But if you think about a $50 a ton tax on carbon dioxide emissions, there's about 5 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels, energy related in the US. So you're talking 
$250 billion a year, two and a half trillion dollars over 10 years. There's not many other things that can raise that kind of revenue. So I think the logic for a carbon price, not in place of other things, it, it can work alongside infrastructure investments, it works alongside regulatory standards. I think the logic for a carbon price is still there. Um, and while we may not see it uh, in this, you know, in, in this infrastructure battle, I, I think the logic of it will keep it um, alive. And I think we will see it uh, in the coming years. Thank you. We have time for just two more brief questions before we shift to our closing remarks. Um, I have the first for Alice and the next for Janie. Um, the first for Alice um, is around COP26. We have a tremendous number of questions coming in about COP26 and one from Alessio Stuto, a project manager with uh, Oxfam, has asked us to um, share a little bit more about um, what might be some ideal COP26 outcomes and what, what might we expect to see in terms of the US role and what kinds of new coalitions might we see emerging? Well, on the COP26, um, I hope that we see far greater focus on preparing uh, least developed nations for the impacts of climate change. It, you don't have to look far uh, to see how devastating this is. You know, Honduras in 1999 suffered Hurricane Mitch, just a terrible event. In fact, as a result of that, the United States let um, uh, I believe several million Hondurans stay in the United States and just gave them essentially temporary protected status, which grew into permanent protected status because the economy was so devastated. We've just seen that same region have two back-to-back -back category five hurricanes. They were already broke, suffering from violent extremism, crime, you name it. Uh, and their agricultural system had been decimated by coffee rust, drought, agricultural uh, coffee production had dipped tremendously. That's why we see kids. Families are simply telling their kids, you go north, you've got to find a better wife, life. There's a, there's survival migrants. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what are we going to do collectively over 190 nations to address what we know is a crisis? They have a debt crisis now, Plus they have these impacts coming in that they have no means of addressing and their populations will suffer. So we need innovative insurance mechanisms. We've seen a lot of these across Africa and Asia, um, forecast-based financing where you give uh, individuals money in advance so that they can prepare for an in incoming typhoon. Uh, we've seen parametric insurance based on how what the drought, how the pictures, the satellite pictures of how green or brown the ground is. We need to scale these across the board so that we are helping populations survive and then give some real thought about long-term solutions to build resilience. So I would see a full economic package and recommitment in a way uh, that certainly meets our prior obligations, which we have not done for the Green Climate Fund, but far greater ambition and finding ways to uh, marshal private capital mm -hmm. to be part of this fight as well. Thank you very much for that. And our closing question before we shift to our closing remarks is for Janie regarding the um, sustainable development goals. This question comes from Andrew Rodriguez with the um, Department of Political Science at UC Berkeley. And Andrew asks, um, where does the, you know, how do we think about sustainable development goals in relation to broader US environmental policy? Uh, you know, I, I, I think that um, I will say that New York City actually has um, uh, voluntarily reported out on our progress for the sustainable development goals. Um, I think we were the first city um, locality to do that. Um, and I uh, haven't been tracking whether other cities are also doing it at this point, but um, uh, it's been, I think, a useful um, a useful framework for us to think about not only our environmental policies, but rather our policies more holistically across um, environment, economy, housing, um, equity. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's been used, it's a useful framework, an organizing framework. Um, you know, I'm not sure that I am the best person to speak to this overall, though. Um, I'm, I have a feeling Kelly and Nat might have other um, perspectives to add. Um, Kelly or not anything on um, SDGs. It was, um, yeah, certainly it was a very, very high profile set of priorities when it came out, building on the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, any other points to add there? 
guess the only other thing I'll say is that um, President Biden, I mean, it's really early days yet. We have to remember he's only been in office for a couple of months, but uh, he did, one, I think one of his very important executive orders uh, so far um, is uh, actually orders the U.S. government and all of its development agencies and all of its foreign um, engagement agencies to mainstream climate into all operations. Um, and of course, climate is a really important part of the SDGs. Um, I mean, the SDGs cover, you know, a big wide spectrum, um, you know, from sanitation to economic development to sustainable energy. Um, but I think we're just at the beginning of starting to see from the Biden administration what, what the strategy could look like um, for including the SDGs and in, in all of the work um, that the U.S. government agencies and U.S. funded institutions like the World Bank and um, I've put in the in the um, Q and A answers. You know, we have a really important new um, institution in the United States, the Development Finance uh, Corporation, and I think um, that has a sixty billion dollar authorization, um, and it effectively hasn't been utilized yet. Um, and this is just a. a uh, a tremendous opportunity, I think, for the U.S. government to put its weight behind supporting um, sustainable development in developing countries using this new organization. Thank you all so much. As we wrap up our discussion for today, I'd like to invite panelists to offer a brief closing statement of two or three minutes each to offer your reflections and remarks on the arc of our um, uh, wide-ranging conversation today. You know, do we see a clear roadmap ahead? And um, perhaps if, if you might be bold enough to touch on it is what will we be talking about if we were to reconvene this panel in five years from now? Um, Nat, let's start with you and then um, Alice, Janie and Kelly. Well, thanks so much. And, and thanks for a great discussion. I, you know, I think the overall arc is one of tremendous optimism and hope. I mean, we will see next week what Biden administration comes out with for its target. I'm, I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic that we'll be ambitious. And, and one thing I want to note is if we do get that kind of ambition and then that drives domestic action, that will essentially prove out one of the underlying theories of change behind the Paris Agreement, which is that uh, if we put in place a framework for making commitments and for following up on them and measuring them and ratcheting them up over time, uh, that we will help for the first time to have international action on climate drive domestic action. That has never really happened before, um, but I think we're on the cusp of seeing it happen. And, and that will be a very good sign for the US and so and for the world. And so I'm not gonna make a prediction, but in building on that and building on that optimism, I hope that in five years, I'm gonna say the Harris administration, I, I hope actually that President Biden has two, two terms and then perhaps Kamala Harris is the second term, but just all, to be fun, I'll say it's that in five years, we'll be looking at the first few months of the Harris administration um, and we'll be looking at the upcoming COP31, where uh, with countries having made significant progress on their existing NDCs, they are coming back once more for COP31 to make even more ambitious targets for 2030 and 2035, and that the world is finally on the path to keeping the door open uh, to having temperatures well, the temperature rise well below two degrees and even with one and a half degrees in sight. So I'll end with a very optimistic note. Thank you for that, Nat and Alice. Well, I love Nat's picture, so I hope that comes to pass. Uh, what I hope we don't have is that we're looking back and regretting that we missed this very important opportunity that he is here right now to address climate change. And one of the things I hope that we will engage in in the next five years is a serious effort first to get particularly Americans to start talking and caring about climate change. Uh, our polling shows that the vast majority of Americans simply don't discuss the issue. And uh, we have a huge deficit in the understanding on the issues. Uh, our education system has not mandated and really constructed uh, widespread courses to educate uh, both young people and the decision makers. 
And unfortunately, most of our decision makers uh, may not have had any education on climate change and sometimes their choices reflect that. So I hope that in the interim, uh, climate change will be become a much better understood and therefore acted upon uh, risk that has materialized and will only grow in the future generations. So I hope we're at the beginning and not looking back at uh, what turned out to be a poor turning point for us. Thank you, Alice. Janie, how are you? Um, how are you feeling? Optimistic? I am feeling optimistic, and I'm I'm gonna ride Nat's optimism train here um, and say that um, in addition to making such uh, incredible progress on decarbonization, I'm hoping that we're also making similar progress on adaptation. I hope that we're modern modernizing our government um, and really incorporating uh, consideration of climate risks across decisions um, around uh, across uh, operations, grant programs, programs, uh, other kind of programmatic interventions, missions. Um, I'm uh, hoping that, you know, we um, uh, change our federal policy to incentivize uh, pre-disaster mitigation. Um, so, and pair that with, with real funds to, to um, support uh, cities, states, um, uh, territories, tribes to um, really take proactive action. Um, and I hope we're also recognizing the, um, the, the, the ways to adapt that really don't have anything to do with our built environment. Um, things like investing in social cohesion, which can be so impactful um, and is really just based on the simple tenet of neighbors helping neighbors, um, but uh, can really play an important role in how we prepare for a changing climate. Um, and I think those, those are some of the kinds of things that can really also help us uh, make sure that we're keeping equity at the center of this conversation. Thank you so much, Janie. And Kelly, will the US have joined the 30 countries that have passed formal climate legislation uh, in five years from now? What do you think? So I would say in five years, I would be thrilled if the US had passed a climate law and was on a pathway for a really stable, durable, um, you know, glide path to net zero by mid-century. Um, but I think more fundamentally, uh, I would love to have seen the United States have pioneered a climate resilient, low carbon, infrastructure led development model that developing countries could be emulating around the world. And in fact, that the United States would be helping those developing countries achieve that climate resilient, uh, low carbon uh, development. And, you know, I think the United States is actually perfectly capable of doing it. It just needs to put its mind to it and get down to business. Well, with that, what a note to end on. Thank you so very much to our distinguished panelists, Janie Bavishi, Alice Hill, Nat Cohen, and Kelly Sims Gallagher for your incredibly insightful discussion. We'll hope to welcome you back for future Chatham House events in person as soon as it is safe and possible to do so. I'd like to thank our wonderful Chatham House event coordinators, Anum Farhan from EER and Anar Bhatta from the US and Americas program. And I'd also like to extend my many thanks to our fantastic audience for your engagement and your very thoughtful questions. We hope you'll continue um, the conversation with us through the Chatham House social media accounts on our LinkedIn and Twitter pages, which are a great way to connect with our experts and outputs. Um, our next ESDS um, event is on Earth Day, Thursday, April 22nd. The session will focus on youth voices in climate action, featuring incredible young leaders from Nepal, Bangladesh, Zambia, and Moldova. Um, please see the link in the chat from Anum, which will also be shared on our social media in the coming week. Uh, once again, the recording from today will be available in about two days time um, via the Chatham House website. Thank you all so much. Um, and I'd like to give a, a round of applause to our, our fantastic panelists for the discussion today. I'm sure we'll all be keeping tuned for what comes from the US Climate Summit. And I very much hope that the optimistic um, uh, portrait that you've painted for five years from now will come true. And with any luck, we'll be meeting in person at Chatham House around then. Wishing you all a wonderful rest of the day and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Thank you so much.